Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the second technical session of the national webinar, National Education Policy 2020, a paradigm shift. We have with us as our resource person, Dr. Moshimi Mukherjee. Dr. Moshimi Mukherjee is Associate Professor and Deputy Director at the International Institute for Higher Education, Research and Capacity Building, OP Jindal Global University. She is the member secretary of JGU Research and Ethics Review Board and founding executive director of JGU Center for Comparative and Global Education. <clears throat> Dr. Mukherjee also holds multiple responsible positions outside JGU. She is a fellow and country director, India, of the Society for Transnational Academic Researchers Scholars Network. She is Research Standing Committee member of the World Council of Comparative Education Societies. Recently, she was selected to join the Association of Commonwealth Universities Supporting Research Community Steering Committee. Dr. Mukherjee has been a recipient of the prestigious Fulbright Fellowship in the United States in 2005. In 2007, she was awarded the Phi Beta Delta Honor Society Medallion in the US for her contribution in international education. She was also awarded the Washington Center Civic Engagement Award in 2007. Dr. Mukherjee brings with her rich experience and professional network in international higher education. She has been engaged in teaching, research, and scholarly engagement globally for the past 20 years in India, the United States, and Australia. She has also taught as a visiting professor in Saudi Arabia for a semester. She has worked as a consultant with reputed global research organizations and think tanks such as the World Bank, UNESCO IIEP, Higher Education Strategy Associates, Australia India Institute and National Council for Educational Research and Training. Recently, she has co-authored NEP 2020 implementation document jointly published by the Association of Indian Universities and OP Jindal Global University. Dr. Mukherjee will speak on NEP 2020 and teachers' education. Dr. Moshmi, welcome to the webinar. The time is all yours. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Sunita Komui. I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. Yes, yes. Thank you to the principal, Dr. Sabita Sen, um, uh, coordinator, uh, Sri B. R. Upadhyay, and uh, convener, Sri Dekar, and also uh, Professor Vaisar Murthy, uh, Vice Chancellor of RV University and former registrar of the Global University, who connected me uh, to with all of you. And I'm really glad to be here today to share um, uh, some of my own thoughts with regards to teacher education and NEP 2020. Uh, may I quickly share now my screen? I have a little presentation for all of you. Uh, let me quickly share my screen. I hope it is visible to all of you. And I'm also audible, I hope so. Yes, yes, ma'am, you are. Okay, great. Uh, I'm sure uh, or many of you have read the NEP document and are quite aware of uh, what ADP has to say with regards to teachers. I had, uh, though I have been quite busy, but still I was there a little uh, briefly uh, during the inaugural session in the morning today. And I also heard the Dean of School of Education from Northeast Steel University briefly. And I heard what she had to say about teachers and NEP, uh, and uh, I, I, I agree with uh, very much with a lot of the discussion that happened in the morning, but over and over, I would urge all of you to reflect a little on our own uh, heritage, 
Uh, I'm sure I don't need to introduce uh, Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore to any of you in this uh, virtual meeting room. Uh, and this is a small quote from Gurudev Tagore. Uh, don't limit a child to your own learning for she was born in another times. I think we need to really uh, deeply reflect on uh, this very, very uh, thoughtful uh, words from Tagore over a century ago, he was talking about this. So he was always a very forward looking visionary philosopher of education. And this is what he was saying over a century ago. Uh, and we need to constantly think and reflect where, whichever, wherever we are, uh, even after a century ago, we need to think that when we are thinking about uh, the education of the future generation, we need to always keep that in mind that they were born in another time compared to the times that we were born. Now let's look at the times in which the kids are living, uh, the young generation today, uh, they are living. What are the contemporary realities these young people, they're facing in contemporary times, uh, fraught with all these various uh, very difficult global level challenges like climate change. We are all in the middle of a global health pandemic right now, uh, which is ongoing uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We are standing here in 2021, looking towards 2022, still with a lot of uncertainty because the global uh, pandemic, we are hosting this um, uh, national uh, 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 seminar and in the form of a webinar because the pandemic. And of course, terrorism, which has also gone global with the advancement of science and technology and, and global, the fast pace of globalization in recent times. And also, uh, we are in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution with artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, Internet of Things, and, and all these innovations that is going on all around us with regards to science and technology, which is in a way an enabler. Otherwise, we in the middle of the pandemic, of course, there has been a lot of learning loss, particularly for uh, disadvantaged children and students around the world. But still, even those who have had access uh, to continue education in the middle of the pandemic through online classes, even they would not have had this access without the advancement in science and technology. Okay, but nothing is an unmixed blessings, just as the advancement in science and technology has globalized um, uh, the operations of terrorist organizations. It has also created new problems like cyberbullying and all kinds of cybercrime. And many a times the students themselves are becoming victim of these uh, kind of online um, uh, uh, antisocial activities. Uh, uh, though we are all part of social media, but we know there is a lot of antisocial activities also these days happening even in the social, uh, virtual social spaces and social media. So what do we do when we think about uh, education for young people in these contemporary times? And how can we help our teachers align the education that they deliver in the classroom with the needs of the students who are living in these contemporary times, surrounded by all these very, very, um, uh, you know, uh, difficult realities, uh, uh, a lot of challenges ahead of them. Now, the annual status of education report, I'm sure all, uh, many of you in this room, they, you're fam familiar of this as a reports now, uh, which, uh, uh, which is being released uh, uh, for several years since 2005, uh, every year now by this organization called Path Pratham. And uh, the ASA reports, uh, several research studies have highlighted the need to overhaul teachers' training to attract the best candidates in the teaching profession to improve the quality of teaching in schools. And a significant uh, part of the problem uh, of the education system within the larger Indian context is poorly trained teachers and teacher absenteeism. Uh, 
and only 2.32% teachers in unaided schools receive in-service training compared to 43.44% for government schools. And this is according uh, to the government's DIS report. But even this training is quite inadequate uh, often uh, in terms of the uh, number of days spent for training and also the quality of training. So there's a serious need for an overhaul of the entire teacher education uh, system focusing on the application of theory through rigorous practice and highest ethical standards within the larger Indian context. And there's no doubt about that. And uh, we, we all agree and we are all on board with regards to this. Now we need to uh, now uh, focus on what NEP is actually, or look at what NEP is actually telling us about teacher education. Now NEP has some really, really very uh, progressive things to talk about teacher education, some very important things to talk about teacher education, NEP clause 15, uh, particularly with regards to uh, the in uh, not just the delivery of teacher education, but also the teacher education uh, uh, as higher education institutions. Now we all know, and there has been a lot of research studies on this also, a large part of the problem of teacher education is standalone teachers training institutes. Mo majority of them across the country are in the private sector and majority of them, the quality standards are extremely poor. So NEP is talking about bringing in multidisciplinary perspective into teacher education and making education, teacher education as, uh, as the integral work of education departments located within multidisciplinary universities. Uh, rather than standalone teacher training institutes to have the, to have teachers training programs embedded within uh, uh, the ambit of uh, or uh, scope of multidisciplinary uh, research universities and to make it compulsory for standalone teachers training institutes to submit performance appraisal reports every year to connect with a network of public and private schools with uh, the multidisciplinary university in the region to coordinate practice teaching, research and teacher recruitment, to recruit faculty from diverse disciplinary backgrounds to the schools and departments of education within the multidisciplinary education uh, university to bring multidisciplinary perspectives into teacher education. We, we know education in itself is a multidisciplinary field of study. Uh, even if you look at the philosopher, the major philosophers of education, they are coming from various diverse fields, from psychology, from sociology, um, from uh, mainstream philosophy, from uh, uh, you know political science, from economics. Education is a multidisciplinary field in itself. And when we think of teacher education, we also need to think about bringing in these multidisciplinary perspectives into teacher education to, and to empower the regulatory system to make stringent actions on particularly the dysfunctional teacher education institutes and to raise the quality standards in teacher education and teaching profession um, uh, in terms of entrance to teacher education programs to be done through a standardized test by national testing agency, to launch a four-year bilingual integrated dual B A, uh, you know, BA, 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 BAC, BA, uh, BCOM to be offered by multidisciplinary AT, uh, higher education institutions uh, to make it compulsory for all fresh PhD entrants, irrespective of discipline, to take credit-based courses in teaching pedagogy and writing in their chosen PhD subject during doctoral training, because this is another problem. When we think about teacher education, we only think about the school education sector. We don't always think about the tertiary education sector. You might be an excellent researcher, you might be absolutely an expert in your field of research, but teaching in the classroom is a completely different thing uh, altogether. 
teaching and learning until and unless you have some knowledge about teaching and learning pedagogy. You might be a great researcher, star researcher, but as a teacher, you can really be a failure in the classroom. So it's extremely important to also focus on teacher education at the tertiary level also. To make in-service continuous professional development mandatory for college and university teachers through existing institutional arrangements and online mode through Swayam, Diksha and all these platforms. And to create a national mission for mentoring, this is something we also recommended strongly in the implementation document to be developed with a large pool of outstanding senior and retired faculty from within and outside India who have been exceptional in teacher education and to offer certification courses in teaching uh, to all postgraduate students, those who are interested in teaching. And I personally think and, and our entire team of uh, uh, faculty and staff here who uh, worked uh, along with uh, uh, staff at Association of Indian Universities, we think these are some really, really uh, very, very important and very um, forward looking recommendations with regards to teacher education, if we really, really need to improve the quality of education uh, in the country, we need to seriously think about the quality of teacher education. But what, what do we want to eliminate? We need to think about that. Of course, as I already mentioned, we really definitely need to eliminate completely business-oriented teacher education institutes, which are dysfunctional and not attempting serious teacher education, but are essentially selling degrees for a price. And inefficient regulatory efforts, which have neither been able to curb malpractices in the system, nor enforce basic standards for quality. Complicated bureaucracy in teachers' recruitment process. Um, this, again, is a major problem. Uh, I have personally visited, done many field visits in different parts of the uh, country, including the Northeast, and, and um, uh, observed that this could be a really, really uh, big hurdle. And thereafter, underestimation of the linguistic and cultural diversity of the country during teachers' recruitment. I think this is another thing we need to think about it very seriously. And I'm sure, uh, particularly in the Northeast, all of you would very much appreciate um, uh, the, what we are trying to say here with regards to uh, the, the uh, need to recognize the linguistic and cultural diversity uh, at the uh, even uh, while we are doing teacher recruitment. Now, here is a quick uh, snapshot of how we can do it. And this is uh, something I have taken from the implementation document uh, that we developed uh, with uh, the um, research wing of the Association of Indian Universities. I'm sure all of you know about uh, the, uh, the proposal for establishment of a higher education uh, commission of India, HECI, and uh, the National Higher Education uh, Research Commission uh, to establish a phase out policy, uh, particularly for the dysfunctional teachers training institutes. Uh, this is something that was uh, recommended in the implementation document, particularly at the a macro level at the government level, what the governments and regulators can do. There were three levels of recommendations in the policy document, macro level um, at the level of the uh, um, central government, meso level at the le level of individual state or regional government, and um, micro level at the level of institutions. So, um, and thereafter, uh, we uh, talked about establishing quality standards of all departments and schools of education need to do annual needs assessment by local school management committees uh, and integration of quality evaluation and needs assessment outcome within the NAC accreditation process, integration of departmental data and needs assessment outcome within the uh, disclosure audit process, 
entrance tests for teacher education program to be established through National Testing Agency that uh, is already there in the policy document and considering, uh, but considering linguistic and cultural diversity is also another very important thing that needs to be taken care of because if we have one standardized test in one particular language, uh, that is not going to serve the purpose within the diverse context of uh, uh, India. Thereafter, HECI and HEGC to conduct an analysis of the school education sector across the globe to identify means to making teaching profession globally competitive. Sal we have even talked about salary incentives and benefits of teachers to be enhanced to attract the best and the brightest in the school teaching profession. If you go around the world and study some of the best systems of, high, uh, of, uh, of uh, education, whether it is in Western country or even in Eastern countries, um, uh, uh, you know, of course, much smaller than India, uh, say Singapore, but even uh, say a country um, uh, which is uh, as big and bigger, in fact, and more populous than India, say China or Taiwan or uh, South Korea. If you look at all these Japan, if you look at even all these East Asian countries, you know, in order to attract the best and brightest into the uh, teaching profession, we really need to think about these things also. Uh, the, 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 the environment within which uh, teachers are going to work, the salaries, incentives, and also benefits uh, need to be thought about seriously because within Indian context, the moment you go and talk to some of the best and brightest students, you ask them, Either they say, oh, I want to be a doctor or engineer, or I want to do an MBA. Uh, uh, rarely you come across uh, good students saying, I want to be a teacher. And until and unless we are able to really make the teaching profession uh, attractive and lucrative, uh, we are not going to be able to attract the best and brightest into the profession. So thereafter, the recommendation was to develop global uh, mentoring program by incorporating outstanding uh, something which is also referred in the policy document, um, uh, teachers uh, as members of national mission for mentoring. And this is something that needs to happen uh, at, the, uh, at the national level uh, to, to really uh, promote this mentoring program across uh, different states and institutions. And thereafter, uh, we talked about developing a composition metrics for the departments of education to have diversity of disciplines. Because if we are talking about uh, uh, bringing in multidisciplinary perspective into teacher education, we need to also recruit faculty from diverse disciplinary backgrounds within the departments and faculties of education. They should take into consideration social sciences, STEM and language studies to ensure holistic teacher education. And of course, schools and departments of education should develop something I've already mentioned, need to develop a network of private and government schools within their neighborhood where the student teachers will receive their practical teachers training and will be eventually uh, recruited. So the teachers training and recruitment should uh, uh, needs to go hand in hand aligned uh, together. If you go to, uh, once again, I would uh, say, uh, share this, if you go and visit some of the best systems of education around the world. I have personally observed for several years, for the past 20 years, this is what I've been doing. There, there is a strong alignment, uh, you know, that the teachers, they are sent for practice teaching in the schools. They, they also develop action research projects uh, in those schools uh, while they are doing their practice uh, training. And thereafter, Within that network only, there's uh, through the education department uh, in the in the universities as the students graduate, they get recruited. So there's a close alignment with regards to uh, the teachers training and recruitment process, and the university education department plays a nodal role uh, with regards to that. And of course, collaborations can be developed in the form of training programs uh, with, with schools in, in the form of training programs for existing school teachers um, and students. 
and and we need to really engage schools with uh, higher uh, uh, higher education and also higher education uh, university research projects uh, i was in china a few years ago back in 2016 i was absolutely um, really, really impressed to see high school students uh, uh, in Beijing. They are doing research during the summer uh, summer break. They're doing research at Beijing Normal University with some of the top researchers in the university. And this is how the students, the high school students, are also getting a research orientation. Uh, and, and this becomes also part of their portfolio for uh, application into universities and colleges as they uh, graduate uh, from high school. So we really need to think about these kind of closer alignment with the school system and universities and colleges by inviting schools to attend conferences, seminars and workshops, and also developing these kind of, um, you know, research orientation also for uh, uh, students. Thereafter, uh, of course, and this is something the policy document itself talks about is developing four year bilingual integrated be it programs along with existing two year one year programs that are ongoing and to develop courses in teaching and learning pedagogy in higher education for all doctoral students. This is something uh, institutionally we need to work on and also to create new upgraded online professional development programs through the existing portals that we have and probably portals also could get an upgrade uh, through uh, experts in digital instructional design. But how do we proceed? We're all in the middle of a COVID-19 disruption around the world. And uh, education, it's a, though it's a health emergency, education and every sector of the economy and our personal and professional lives have been deeply affected by this health pandemic. But at the same time, as I already said before, this has also pushed us really, uh, it's no longer a slogan, to act locally and think globally as we are in the middle of this global pandemic. Even before uh, uh, you know, the, the pandemic actually hit us, we, we were all listening about this slogan, right? Think globally and act locally. But somehow the pandemic has actually made the slogan so very uh, absolutely meaningful uh, right now in front of all of us. Of course, we need to align. And if we talk about thinking globally and acting locally, we need to align our higher education institutions uh, and teacher education to the goals of the contemporary times. We, we, if we, we, uh, I began this presentation by quoting from Tagore and talking about the need to align the educational goals with contemporary times and also the goals of uh, teacher education. And then we definitely need to think about aligning our uh, teacher education and uh, the, the aims and objectives with uh, the, the needs of contemporary times and the sustainable development, 17 sustainable development goals. Now, I know that you here at Shillong Commerce College also do recognize uh, this, that we do need to uh, uh, think globally and act locally. I went into your uh, college's website and saw the vision and mission of this college. And I saw that you're very much as an institution, higher education institution, geared uh, towards delivering excellent programs of teaching and outreach, primarily for the economically disadvantaged of the state and the region as a whole in the Northeast. But at the same time, in terms of your uh, institutional mission uh, to promote learning, you also acknowledge the fact that you need to prepare students with attitude, skills, and habits of lifelong learning and leadership skills, enabling them to be useful members of not just Shillong and Northeast or India, but a global society. Uh, 
so I, I, I think I don't need to further emphasize this fact to all of you present here because I can see that your uh, institution uh, does recognize this uh, uh, you know, mandate already. I would like to now wrap my wrap up my uh, discussion before I can uh, ask all of you to share your thoughts and ask me questions about what I uh, just shared with all of you. I wanted to present to you this new UNESCO document that has been just released last month, 11th of November reimagining a new social contract for education and re, uh, reimagining our futures together. And it, here is a brief summary of the document. Uh, I, I wanted this entire document is available for free from the UNESCO website. If you just Google search a uh, report from the International Commission on the Futures of Education, it will pop up for you and you can download the entire PDF document. But I just wanted to share the short summary of this document for all of you because I found it quite relevant to our discussion on uh, uh, teacher education and reform in teacher education that we need to take very, very seriously. Uh, policy documents will always remain texts, always remain um, um, uh, you know, uh, just uh, something to be studied by researchers until and unless we actually seriously think of implementing it on the ground, each and every institution, they will only remain just texts uh, or, or, and words written on a piece of paper or a, a you know, digital document. But how can we really, really uh, bring it into practice, into our work? This is something we really need to think about. And until and unless we take the core mission and vision of our own institutions and also all these global, national and global organizations really seriously. And until and unless we really work to change the existing system and nothing is going to really work out. So a new social contract of education, why are we talking about it? We need a new social contract to repair injustices while transforming the future. Past injustices, we need to, uh, uh, we, we need to rectify that while uh, at the same time uh, transforming the future. Our humanity and planet Earth are under threat. We all know that the pandemic has only served to prove our fragility and our interconnectedness. Now, urgent action taken together is needed to change course and reimagine our futures. This report by the International Commission on the Futures of Education acknowledges the power of education to bring about profound change. We face a dual challenge of making good on the unfulfilled promise to ensure the right to quality education for every child, youth, and adult, and fully realizing the transformational potential of education as a route for sustainable collective futures. To do this, we need a new social contract for education that can repair injustices while transforming the future. This new social contract must be grounded in human rights and based on principles of non-discrimination, social justice, respect for life, human dignity, and cultural diversity. It must encompass an ethic of care, reciprocity, and solidarity. It must strengthen education as a public endeavor and a common good. This report, two years in the making and informed by a global consultation process engaging around 1 million people, invites governments, institutions, organizations, and citizens around the world to forge a new social contract for education that will help us build peaceful, just, and sustainable futures for all. The visions, principles, and proposals presented here are merely a starting point. Translating and contextualizing them is a collective effort. Many bright spots already exist. This report attempts to capture and build on them. It is neither a manual nor a blueprint, but the opening of a vital conversation. And this is what 
almost all uh, policy documents and reports, they are. Uh, we really, really need to make them work on the ground. And we need to take that step forward ourselves as um, uh, institutional leaders, as teachers, as parents, as various stakeholders in the field of education. We need to make the change happen. With that, I would like to stop here uh, and stop my screen share. Um, I thank all of you for your attention. Oh, I forgot I had one more slide. And I think this is very relevant to our discussion on teacher education and reform uh, with regards to teacher education. Again, from Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore, we began with a uh, small quote from Tagore. I would like to again end with a, another quote from Tagore on teachers. A teacher can never truly teach unless he is still learning himself. A lamp can never light another lamp unless it continues to burn its own flame. The teacher who has come to the end of his subject, who has no living traffic with his knowledge, but merely repeats his lesson to his sub-students, can only load their minds. He cannot quicken them. I think this is so, so insightful and thoughtful. Once again, from Tagore over a hundred years ago, a century ago, uh, and he could see the importance of teach continuous. You see, uh, if you if you read in between the lines, he's really talking about teachers to be lifelong learners here in this in this code. The teacher who has come to the end of his subject, who has no living traffic with his knowledge, but merely repeats his lessons to his students, can only load their minds, he cannot quicken them. With that, Namaskar, and thank you all of you for your attention. I would be very happy uh, to answer any questions or listen to your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mukherjee for that very you know, insightful look into this NEP 2020. And you have ended with a beautiful quotation. And I feel that the relevance of Tagore, even after more than 100 years, is still felt. I think we have a question for you. Yes, please. As, yes, ma'am. What kind of business commerce education do you envisage to make our students useful human resources to the corporate world. Okay, well, I'm not an expert in commerce education. I must first acknowledge my own uh, limitations of knowledge. You know, we all have black holes in our knowledge base. None of us are experts in everything. But of course, I can, uh, nowadays there is a lot of opportunity uh, for commerce students uh, particularly in the contemporary times of uh, globalization, uh, uh, particularly in the corporate sector, and not just in the corporate sector, there is a new startup culture that has emerged in the, in the past decade or so. And there is a lot of opportunity, particularly for students from commerce backgrounds. Uh, uh, unlike, you know, uh, when we were in college, when we were growing up, there weren't as many opportunities. The moment you enter into a commerce college, oh, you are going for a CA, charter, you become an accountant or a chartered accountant or, uh, you know, uh, take some government exam to apply for some government job in the accounts or finance department. But now with the, the, the way the economy has diversified, I think there, there is a lot of uh, scope, particularly for students from commerce background. And this is an age of globalization of trade and commerce uh, around the world. So there is a there lot, lot more opportunity, frankly speaking, for students from commerce background. So you, you the, the entire uh, supply chain of, of, of businesses and manufacturing, they have become global right now. They have globalized so much, much more opportunities than uh, we had, uh, you know, uh, 10 years or 20 years ago. Thank I you, ma'am. I don't know whether I was able to satisfy 
uh, the the person who asked the question with my response, but that's all I could share. Do we have more questions from participants? But there's one thing I would really like to add, particularly with regards to commerce students and students uh, in the field of trade and commerce and business. Once again, when we are talking about education, education in any field or discipline, Okay, whether it is science and technology, whether it is humanities, whether it is trade and commerce, in the 20, even uh, as I was talking about teacher education in general, which encompasses teachers who teach um, in science uh, field, uh, STEM areas or humanities, social science, commerce, in the, in the we cannot uh, disconnect our education in any discipline or field with the realities of the contemporary times. So even for students of trade and commerce, uh, we cannot think about doing trade and commerce uh, uh, with, uh, as uh, experts would say, we cannot uh, continue to do quote unquote business as usual. Whatever we do in terms of our commercial activities and work, we need to think about the sustainable development goals. We are in the. We are at uh, facing a, a, a reality where the sustainability of our entire planet Earth is in question. Not just humans for us, our own sustainability. It's not just the question of life and death for humans. It's a question of the sustainability of the entire planet Earth, which is our home where we live. So even when we are thinking about trade and com commerce and commercial activities, we need to think about doing it in an environment-friendly and sustainable way. And that's why you will see one of the sustainable development goals, uh, I don't remember exactly which sustainable development goals, but one of the sustainable development goals talks about uh, responsible consumption and production. Yes, sustainable development goal 12 talks about responsible consumption and production. Because on the one hand, we are facing a situation where there is overproduction and overconsumption. We are creating a lot of waste, uh, you know, which includes electronic waste, e waste. And at the same time, we are facing a reality where uh, there is a people still, uh, uh, we have not been able to come to a stage of development where there is zero hunger or no poverty in this world. That's why the sustainable development goal is no poverty and goal two is zero hunger because uh, we are facing a stark re reality globally, not just in one country. Globally, we are facing a stark reality of overproduction and overconsumption and uh, totally starved people under uh, malnourished children and, uh, uh, and so when we think about trade, commerce, doing business, and at the same time, this entire environmental crisis, climate change, all these issues that we are facing right now is uh, an effect of the way we have done business in the past, you see? We are, uh, we have polluted. Why, we, why is this now the sustainable development goal is clean water and sanitation? Okay, uh, uh, climate change, uh, cl sustainable development 13 is talking about climate action. Why? Because we, earlier on through our own actions, as we have done business, as we have done trade and commerce, we have just prioritized our own business goals to make profit. Okay, we have, we have to do a trade and commerce anyhow. We have to maximize our profit anyhow, even if it leads to environmental de destruction and degradation, even if it leads to over 
consumption by a particular group of people and under consumption by another group of people. We have done business like this in the past. We just cannot do that. So I will, for, for trade and commerce students, I would say in the 21st century, we definitely need to think about commerce education also through the lens of sustainable development goals. How can we really do business? How can we really do trade and commerce that is going to be just that is going to be uh, uh, sustainable as a as a as a venture as a, a business, uh, but at the same time, that is not going to have harmful effects on people or environment around us. Okay. Thank you. We have another question for you. How can Indian ethos and culture? be applied in teacher education to prepare future future teacher in the Indian context? Okay, that's a really good question. Uh, now, Indian ethos and culture, of course, every culture, every society has its pros and cons, okay? We have a strong tradition of Gurukul system we have a strong tradition of system of revering the teacher, the gurus, which has its, of course, um, own limitations. We all know the story of Ekalavya from Mahabharata, right? Yes. So, so we can't forget that, okay? In fact, uh, I know about uh, actually a, a civil society organization by the name uh, Ikilavya, who actually work for the uh, education of marginalized uh, students within the larger Indian context. We need to also acknowledge the fact that the Gurukul system was also not a hundred percent. We cannot exactly um, uh, you know, uh, uh, bring that system back in contemporary times. Even when Tagore built his own school in the model of the ancient Gurukul schools, he um, uh, innovated. Tagore did not start his own uh, school in Shantiniketan exactly the way the Gurukuls ran thousands of years ago because there, there were no girls in those Gurukuls. In Tagore school, there were girls studying uh, in the same school, sitting side by side beside boys. Okay, even in England, there were very few coeducational schools during those times. There were single sex schools. But here in India, during British India, Tagore was actually, he was bringing, so he, he was extremely, I think, forward looking kind of a visionary and also a ref real reformist thinker. Even when he was bringing back those ancient uh, ethos of Gurukul schools, close relationship between the teachers and students, uh, you know, students almost becoming part of like a real family living together with the gurus and the teachers. But at the same time, uh, he, he was also making the necessary changes uh, he recognized the limitations of ancient Gurukul schools. And only, of course, you know, uh, even boys belonging to certain class and caste background and all these things, they could study in the ancient Gurukuls. But in Tagore's uh, school, uh, there were students coming from all various different diverse backgrounds, not just gender, caste, class, different background. So we need to, I think we have very good uh, a, a, a history to look back upon uh, in our recent contemporary uh, times, you know, to look at how uh, progressive education reformers and philosophers and thinkers within our own context have sought to reinvent uh, and innovate uh, by merging ancient Indian uh, tradition and ethos with the needs of the contemporary times. I think we need to do that. And we, if we talk about uh, inclusion and creating institutions uh, and, and educational institutions inclusive in the 21st century, now we need to also think about not just gender in terms of inclusion of women, but also third gender and those who are 
gender non-identified students, right? So we, we need to, and, and this is something Tagore said all the time, you need to align the, need, the goals of education with the contemporary times. And you need to always think that your child is born in another time compared to your time. And we'll be also living the quote with which I began, uh, the first quote from Tagore with which I began my presentation was uh, a very short and simple, but very meaningful quote. We should not limit a child to our own learning for she was born in another times. So we can, there are a lot of treasures in our past, in our history and in course we can bring that into teacher education, but we need to also reinvent and align them with the needs of contemporary times and the future. I hope I was able to answer the question. You need to unmute. Hence the relevance of Tagore, ma'am. Yes. It is only it is only in an environment where the mind is without fear and the head is held high that we can thrive and we can move towards you know the you know the future towards the future in you know in a way which will be fruitful and progressive. Right. So Tagore will always be relevant at any time and anywhere. So we do not have any more questions. I think you have been able to deliberate in such a clear manner that we have all understood what you were trying to say. Thank you, ma'am, for being so clear and so precise. And it was a pleasure to have you with us. And we hope that this, we will be meeting you again for future webinars. Sure, I would also love to, and not just a webinar, I hope I can physically visit your college sometime. Yes, yes, we hope that in the near future, we will be able to have a seminar where you will be gracing us with your physical presence. Thank you, I'd love to do that. And thank you all thank once you, again for your attention. And I can share the presentation, I can email it to you, to your principal. If you want yes. it, I can I can do that right away. Yes, ma'am, that would be wonderful and so generous and gracious of you. Thank you, ma'am. Have welcome. a nice day and stay safe, ma'am. You, you too. Bye bye. So we have come to the end of the second technical session, and we hope that you have been able to glean a lot of information from what Dr. Mukherjee has shared with us. Thank you for being such patient listeners. And we will now come to the last part of today's program. I now call upon Ms. JC Bla, Vice Principal, to deliver the vote of thanks. Hello, everyone. I hope it is clear. Is it audible? Yes, yes, you're audible, ma'am. Okay, thank you, ma'am Conwell. We know that education is fundamental for achieving full human potential, developing an equitable and just society, and promoting national development. Such a lofty goal will require the entire education system to be reconfigured to support and foster learning. This new education policy, it is the first education policy of the 21st century, and it aims to address the many growing developmental imperatives of our country. It lays particular emphasis on the development of the creative potential of each individual. It is based on the principle that education must develop not only cognitive uh, capacities, but also social, ethical, and emotional capacities and dispositions. It is thus relevant to conduct this two-day webinar on NEP 2020, a paradigm shift. Respected resource persons of the day, Professor Nongbre and Professor Mukherjee. Our respected principal ma'am, 
Mrs. Sen, honorable teachers and my dear friends and colleagues. I deem it a great honor to propose the vote of thanks on this momentous occasion in making this webinar such a resounding success. First of all, I would like to offer my hearty thanks to the resource persons of today's webinar. You have taken out time from your busy schedule and enlightened us with lots of informative knowledge. It gave us deep insights into the topic. The lectures and presentations were not only excellent, but thought provoking. You surely made today's webinar interesting and meaningful. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Nongri and Professor Mukherjee. I would also like to express our profound uh, gratitude to our principal, Ma'am Sen, for this webinar cannot shape without a hardworking leader like you. Your dedication, enthusiasm, involvement, and inspiration have surely made today's program a successful one. Furthermore, let's have a special recognition and offer our thanks to the organizers of this webinar, the technical team, Assistant Professor Mantri Pasar, Associate Professor Dr. S. Kongwer, the chairperson of today's webinar, to all my uh, to all the teaching and non-teaching staff of the college who have diligently carried out all the allotted duties in making this webinar a grand success. Thanks to all the participants who have over, uh, overwhelmingly attended, responded, and contributed to this successful webinar. I sincerely apologize if I have missed out on somebody. In uh, conclusion, my words are not enough to express the gratitude for this day's program, which has been enriching, enjoyable. It is our duty to express our gratitude and say thanks to all of you who have made this webinar possible and successful. A big, big thank you to all of you. God bless and stay safe. Thank you. So I'm back. So we have come to the end of today's program. Thank you, Ms. Bla, for that beautiful vote of thanks. And I would also like to express my thanks to our principal, for having organized this and to the commerce department for being behind the scenes at all times. So we meet again tomorrow at 10 a.m. for the third technical session. Thank you, God bless, stay safe.